hand over to Jose Latel and Daniel Rodriguez for the last uh, talk of the night. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Oh, the camera. Can everyone hear me? One, two, three. Am I super loud? No. But if you can't hear me, let me know. So, uh, thank you again, Donald and, and Kristen, for you know all the hard work you guys do to organize this. Um, Basically, Daniel and myself are going to talk a little bit about something that we recently open sourced, which is a reference system for one of the production systems that we have here at Facebook that's called Nenorad. So, you know, we very creatively decided to call it Open Nenorad. You know, a lot of like hard thinking there. So, that's me, that's Daniel. I always tend to put this uh, on the presentations because I find that it tends to help people understand some of the challenges that we have to deal with when they actually realize what's our scale, right? Very quickly, these are numbers that are recent as of a couple of weeks ago. Essentially, we have 1.37 billion daily active users, and we have uh, a little over 2 billion monthly active users. So the size of our network and the scale challenges tend to be very interesting, right? And this com comes at the heart of the problem that we're trying to solve with this system, which is essentially, you know, loss in the, on the network, right? And a lot of our topologies, at least in the data center, look a little like this, which, you know, has some symmetry and order. You know, in the back one, they look much worse. It's essentially like uh, being able to answer the question of like, you know, we all know that like latency changes actually affect things like TCP and affect throughput and loss, you know, does disasters on this. So like, you know, like in the beginning, because the door is a system that we have worked on and, you know, developed for a very long time, we were, okay, how do we answer that question? And a lot of our automation is not really um, much more difficult than figuring out, okay, if I had the perfect human, what would that perfect human do? Right? And you know, if you had this type of topology where you have two hosts and they are interconnected by that mesh of devices, and you, know, you had some loss or you had some, someone telling you, hey, like, you know, what used to take two hours between these two hosts is taking forever, like, typically there's some active probing involved, right? So like, the perfect human will essentially start doing some active probing, pinging all over the place, or you know, your favorite trace route advanced tool, like we have our own that's called FVTracer T, and essentially try to find the needle in the haystack. So, you know, the system that we build, which is called, as I you know, uh, revealed earlier, Nenorad kind of like addresses that and it's essentially doing the same thing a human would do, but all the time in an automatic fashion, which is very sophisticated. It's essentially pinging all the things. And for this, uh, we run pingers on some of the machines and we run responders on all of them because we don't really need to have a pinger in every single device that we have in the fleet. And this generates a uh, you know, pretty large and substantial amount of data that gets analyzed to actually try to give that network engineer, you know, this is where I think, like in all of this mesh, this is where I think like, you should start your investigation. You know, help you find the, the needle in the haystack, uh, so to speak, right? And this is, you know, which probably like skip a little earlier, like obviously we have, you know, a pretty extensive and pretty developed passive monitoring system, but you know, we run due to the scale, we tend to run into exotic issues that haven't been revealed by passive monitoring simply because the counters are not implemented or we don't have a really good way of detecting this in a passive fashion or simply because the device lies because it has a failure that's making it lie, right? So the evolution of the system, like in the beginning, we, like our first instance of this, we are firm believers of version one, we're firm believers of iterating over the ideas. Like the first version of this was as simply as wrapping the ping, the ping uh, binary in the host with you know, some Python, right? And the, actually the first version wasn't doing anything related to loss, it was simply measuring latency. And it revealed like, why, are we, why do we have like this weird latency between A and B? And it's, you know, it started that, you know, provided visibility that wasn't simply there before, even with passive monitoring. And then, you know, this quickly, when we confirm, oh, this makes sense and this is a good B1 and like, you know, this is a good idea to pursue, you know, we evolved this with using raw sockets and fast TCP probes, which actually worked pretty well. Um, but a lot of our service owners rely on TCP statistics because a lot of the services always, obviously are TCP. So we were essentially polluting a lot of the metrics that they use to understand the network health of their service. So they weren't super psyched. Um, so, you know, we had to iterate and we switched to ICMP, which ICMP, you know, fulfills a similar purpose without actually, you know, having that issue for them. But we run into some ECMP, um, we run into some polarization issues that force us to yet again change the protocol and move into UDP. And this is essentially what the open source version of this is going to be using. It's essentially, a, we are, you know, 
UDP. And the last iteration of this, we essentially kept UDP, but added an extra layer using ICMP because ICMP also fulfilled the purpose. But you know, this way we have, you know, we have additional signal to understand, you know, like our UDP agent is running user space. So like, are we getting this loss simply because we have an issue on that machine where like it's heavily loaded, et cetera, et cetera. Like this gives us another data signal to understand, is this real due to the system or is this real actually, you know, due to the network because of a, you know, a network problem of some sort, right? So this is like, you know, at the core of this, we have fingers and responders and the Mac is like, oh, this animation is super hard, like I'm struggling. Uh, and essentially this is relatively simple. We try to keep the responders as uh, simple as possible because they run in every single machine on the fleet. So obviously we don't want to add unnecessary load or, you know, phone memory leaks into all of the fleet because that's not good, that's negative impact. Um, and essentially like the pingers need, you know, a target list and you know, this we have orchestration internally and Daniel will talk about how we did this in the open source version. So they receive a target list, the responders simply respond to, respond to those probes. We timestamp everything to understand where are we spending our time and like what's actually the latency because remember this is the latency and loss. The pingers can do a lot of work, so a lot of packets per second while we try the responders to like, again, this runs everywhere so it should be as light as possible. And since we have quotes as most of you, we essentially try to do this in like all of our Quos class to, again, understand exotic bugs that we end up with due to, you know, different issues, right? So why UDP? I mentioned, I kind of like mentioned this before, you know, mostly like our use case here was that like we had, uh, we were polluting some of the metrics for the service owners. This also eliminated the problem that we had with ICMP, which, you know, some polarization issues and it's pretty extensible, which means we can tweak it and add more things to the probe structure if we need to, right? So, you know, those are like the basics of the system. When we decided, okay, so now we have all this data, how do we start actually making sense of it? We decided like our unit of loss, right, was going to be clusters. And we call clusters essentially a grouping of top of the racks. So if you think about the yellow uh, devices here as top of the racks, and then the green as some aggregation layer, whatever is like, you know, whatever you wanna call that, depending if you're using a cluster polar, you're using something more uh, old school or smaller. Like that's what we typically call cluster, essentially a collection of top of the racks. And we decided, okay, so our unit of, of loss is going to be the clusters. And this gave us, you know, enough granularity to understand issues between top of the racks. Um, you know, it, you know, contain the concept of let's have dedicated fingers per cluster, which again, like you don't need this to be done by everyone. We try to again, hit every single machine that we have and this gets sent to a time series database and typically it lags in production by a couple of minutes, which is good enough. Like obviously this gets reduced as we, you know, implement improvements, but that's roughly how it looks like in production, right? And this essentially, again, this is not a, this is not gonna tell you the bad device is this, but it, you know, it helps you with your investigation. We have other systems that actually address that question, which we have spoken about in conferences such as RIPE. We have a system that's called NFI that tries to do that part of the job, which is like, okay, the bad device is this, or I have a highly, I suspect pretty high that it's this device. But coming back to this, like, you know, in the case, like our network is organized by regions. Inside the regions, you might have data centers. Inside the data centers, you have a collection of clusters. And then we are pinging all the things, right? So like, for example, for a target cluster, right? We would have a pinger inside the same data center, which is what you're seeing here. So we ping. That gives us a result. We're inside of the same data center, so that tests the data center network. We have a pinger inside of the region. So like, you know, imagine we have dub one and we have dub two. So, you know, dub two would ping here dub one. And then we have something outside of the region also ping that target cluster, which, you know, whatever, some, something in the US. So like basically we have essentially three data points that can point you to like, okay, like there's an issue here. We should look inside the data center. We should look inside the metro uh, of the region, or we should look at the back one, right? And now Daniel is going to talk a little bit about how do we implement this with uh, the open source solution and do a live demo that is going to work fantastic. <laughs> no pressure. Some luck. Huh? Yeah. Okay, so that was a little bit of history on how Facebook built NetNora and an overview of how it actually works. The idea of this open source project is not actually provide you like a, like a box solution that you can, hey, I'm going to put this on my servers, start running, and it will work. It's mostly um, a solution to spark 
like Creativity is a very simple code that works, but the intention is to you go modify it, adapt it, and start from, from there building your system. So if you remember the moons that Jose talked about, all the phases that Facebook has gone through, maybe that's like the first moon for you. Okay, this system might be your first moon and you adapt it from there and start building your solution. So the main component of all this is UDP Pinger. And this is basically a very efficient C++ library that will allow you to have this, pingers and pongers, okay? And that's the core of the OpenNet Nora. So if you have, oh, so if you have pingers and pongers, and let's say you are this guy, and you need to ping a host, let's say you are in here, you know the IP address of that host, you know where it's located, and you know when, when you send a ping, that traffic will go through a series of uh, hops or a, or a specific path, and finally will reach the destination. With that information, you know, okay, I'm having some problems in here or over there. The idea of this is basically taking that same process in an automated way. So how can we build that? We need to know where our host, where are our pongers, where are our destination hosts. And for that, we built uh, a small controller. And this is the most, probably the most basic Python that you will see. It's built on Python, Flask, and a small SQLite database. So what do we do here? Pongers, when they, when they fire up, they have like a, a cron job, and they will register to the controller, okay? They will register the IP address, they will register labels like, uh, I'm on this dat uh, data center, I'm on this cluster, I'm on this specific rack, okay? That information gets into the controller, into the database, and here in this controller we keep the information of all the pongers that we have in the network, all our destination hosts. When the pingers fire up, they will send a request to a controller asking where are all the pongers, okay? So we have our request going to the controller, the controller will reply back with a list of devices to ping. Right now, that list is like all the pongers that we have, okay? You could try to build like a, a smaller segment, try to divide, the amount of pongers that you have in the network to uh, smaller chunks, but in the solution that we have published in the GitHub, this is like all the pongers that you have enabled, okay? And with that list, the pinger will start sending the proofs to the pongers, okay? It will start pinging all the pongers that we have available in the network, and that information, I mean, the results of all this traffic will end up going to the InfluxDB database, okay? InfluxDB is an open source time series database. It's open to anyone to use it. And that information goes in there, and you can visualize it using Chronograph. We have chosen uh, to use Chronograph because it's another op open source project, pretty easy to use, pretty easy to install. But basically, you could use something like Grafana, also popular. Uh, Let's say it provides like a similar function. Or don't use it if you don't, if you don't want it, because at the end, with the information storing here, you could build your automation like, hey, if I'm seeing like latency higher than this, I will do fire up an event. If I'm having packet loss of this amount, I will create like a drain of a device, okay? Here you start having a spark your imagination, okay? And um, that code is on that GitHub site. It's FB, FB samples open that Norad. In there, you will find all the code. And the site, okay, it will look like this. In here, you have a pretty detailed README on how to install it. Uh, step by step, you need to do this on the pingers. You need to do this on the pongers. You need to install 
the database this way, go and install chronograph. Everything is pretty much detailed over there. And important, on the Debian um, folder, you will find packages, the packages that you need to have this working. This is like a pretty, uh, pretty useful stuff because uh, compiling all these things manually is kind of a, a tedious task. So having all these packages are pretty useful. So you also have it in there if you, ma if you happen to be running on Debian. And here is, uh, let's talk a little bit about our demo. So we're going to show you like uh, two scenarios, okay? One, we're going to detect latency on rack tree, okay? We have uh, in here, basically in our network we have uh, pongers on all the racks and on rack one we have pingers, okay? That means that from all racks one we are pinging all the rest of the network, okay? In the particular scenario that we are going to be showing, rack three is going to be having some problems. Let's call it a fiber issue, a port that is not working correctly, and is introducing packet loss. The other scenario that we're going to be showing is packet loss being detected between region Madrid, let's say the data center in Madrid, and SFO, okay? In this path, we're going to detect uh, packet loss, but for example, for Melbourne, we are not going to have any, any latency. All of this is running in the cloud. So uh, this is basically like 25 virtual machines that are actually running on these regions on Australia, US, and here in Europe. And so we have like a pretty good, decent uh, measurement of latency on the network, and we're going to introduce the packet loss. So let's go here. Oh. So you can see here that while I was working, uh, talking, sorry, uh, Jose introduced some latency, some packet loss in the network. We can see that we have like around 10% packet loss in the network, okay? But this is basically our, our layout, a, a dashboard that we have configured for you, for you guys to see. But it's basically, you can lay out the, dash the dashboard as you want, okay? You can mix uh, the information for whatever you want. But basically, we have in here that we are seeing, let's say, the view of Rack 1 in Madrid in Cluster 1, okay? On this side, we have packet loss. On, on this other side, we have latency. So this is the latency measurement within a cluster, okay? This is the packet loss within a cluster. And in here, you can see that um, Rack 1 is detecting some packet loss to Rack 3. Here the green, if, you, if I step over here, you have like around 10% of packet loss, okay? On this side, latency. If we go a little bit down, the same, but this time between cluster, so cluster one, how is the latency showing to other clusters? For example, cluster three and cluster two are, uh, are the other clusters in the same data center. And if we go a little bit down, you can see here our latency for um, Melbourne and SFO. You can see that we have like a pretty real uh, latency measurement for uh, Melbourne and SFO. So it's, it's actually uh, pretty solid of what we have. And while I was talking, Jose introduces some packet loss between regions. That's the other scenario that I was talking about. So we are having in here like around 80% of packet loss. So we have a big problem in there. And with that information, you can actually make decisions. So maybe you want to drain that region, or there is a path that is not working that you need to go and fix. So with just a little bit of Python and, and UDP Pinger, you are able to set up something 
like this. And if we go back into the upper, you can see that we have, we no longer have loss between the racks. So because Jose uh, removed our packet loss uh, uh, generating uh, IP tables. <laughs> so um, that's basically um, what I wanted to show you again. This is Grafana. Uh, you can build your uh, event and alarm in on this product, but you could also work directly with the database with no issues. And if I go back here, it should be good. So thank you very much. Any questions? while people okay. are, are warming up. Uh, we announced it very recently, I think a week or a couple of days ago, that we were uh, you know, requesting comments for research on networking and routing protocols and a lot of other interesting stuff. So this has a deadline of the 7th of December, and basically this so Facebook funds your research. So if you had like this crazy networking idea that you, you know, were looking for someone to fund so you could explore, all the instructions are in that URL and how to apply, and this is basically open to, I think, everyone and non-US as well. So if you guys have like a magical idea, you know, give that a try. Um, so there was a couple of questions. Yep. Okay, so could I just get you to state your first name again when you ask a question? Thanks. Hi, my name is Rafael. Uh, I would like to know if the pongers, they, uh, how they know where to re register? You, is you it? Uh, sorry, uh, that is a <laughs> and that is a. They have a kind of redundancy for the register. Also, okay. uh, oh, uh, another, <laughs> an, another one. There is a ki any kind of uh, <laughs> graceful de register because uh, maybe you want to do a, a, a maintenance in that switch and maybe if you don't de register, it will be a fake yeah yeah positive yeah so first question is you provide the the address of the controller so the bongers uh yeah well, basically chef, chef. you can you can create chef, a chef right? ansible chef. whatever you want and you put the ip address of the controller and then when it fires up it will go to the specific host second question um uh, well i think a third question was uh, re uh regarding redundancy is it the second was redundancy, the third was like if you de-register. So okay, so second redundancy, I mean, the system doesn't have like a built-in re redundancy, but you could easily do it because at the end, the Flask and the Python is a web server, so you can uh, scale down to, I mean, you put the load balancer and you can uh, scale down yeah, that yeah, okay. as much as you want. Okay. And the, I mean, you also have like a SQL, uh, SQLite database that is probably not the most uh, powerful database that, that, that exists, but you can easily replace that with Postgres or MySQL and have like a very robust solution. And the final question, dead host detection. Oh, so yeah, I probably forgot about the telling this, but on the Pongers, there is like a, a cron job that will keep uh, pinging, I mean, not pinging, like it keep, I keep alive to the controller telling, okay, I'm alive. I'm alive, and if you shut down the pinger, it will send that, I mean, uh, on registration, okay? It will deregister from the controller, and it will be removed from the list that we provide to the to the pingers. Yeah. And you can do so many casts to solve the redundancy thing. Yeah, also. Cool, yeah. Uh, Victor, Workday, thanks guys for the wonderful talk, and thanks for sharing that thing with the community, that's awesome. Uh, so probably popular question to this one would be, uh, can you name a couple use cases where you do detect a packet loss with the NetNorad, which is not reflected in the traditional SNMP counters on the interfaces? Uh, you have an ASIC that's dropping packets and doesn't, then it's not instrumented to report it, which happens to us every day. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, like I was telling someone today, like we had a case once, which, yeah, it's on the more exotic side. We had a case once where, because we have all this, you know, like FD Tracer T and all this stuff, which like should help pinpoint where the thing is, right? 
So we had a case once that we had an ASIC that if you send a packet that was 215 bytes, it was good. If you send a packet that was 217 bytes, it was good. If the packet was 216, it would get you know eaten and forever gone. So like you know finding that was uh, tricky, right? It was uh, interesting. So yeah. that type of thing. Yeah, don't trust your boxes. Or basically. the box is like, oh, I have no errors. Like errors are zero, and it's because the agent that reports that crashed. Mm. <laughs> so less exotic, less ex less exotic, right? Mm. So thanks, guys. There was another one in the back. Yeah. Uh, hi, this is Ivo. I'm just wondering, what's your signal-to-noise ratio? Is this reliable enough to make automated decisions to drain afterwards, or do you still have humans making decisions how to recover from these states? Um, the automated part, we typically use the other system, so like the system that's called NFI, because that's actually like, I think if this is this circuit, or I think this is this device. Nenora has always been a tool to, you know, like needle in the haystack, last resort type of thing, right? when you are trying to find why are you eating my 216 bytes packets, right? So, yeah. cool, thank you very much. Okay, any more questions? On that note, can we get a round of applause please for Jose and Daniel? <laughs> thank, thank you so much. All right. Thanks guys. Uh, oh, you be, got a question? Be, before you, <laughs> I, I let Donald do his uh, outro, I have two questions for you from the have you been paying attention tonight category. <laughs> so please tell me, on average, how many, and this is billions, how many active users do Facebook have on a monthly basis? All right, and the second question is, how many speakers did we have tonight? All right. All good, all good. Okay, so we're gonna pretty much wrap up the first part of this evening. Um, we wanna say a really, really big thank you to our host, Facebook. Um, and before we give them a round of applause, I'd just like to call out specifically Mohit out of London, who's not here. Connor, wherever Connor is, has done an absolutely awesome job. Thank you so much this evening. Also, David, I want to say thanks to the speakers, uh, Jose and Daniel. Um, there's also John's floating around, uh, Brendan's over there. I saw Peter at the back as well. Um, so thank you so much indeed to our hosts once again. Uh, the other thing, Again, building community, this is about capture and share. So we really want to capture the knowledge, the learning, the experience, and the wisdom here. And without people like Rian at the back in AV, and also Stuart remotely, uh, that wouldn't be possible. So thank you so much indeed, guys. Thank you very much. <laughs> so if you'll bear with me for probably about another 60 seconds. Um, Essentially, INOG is based upon volunteers, so we would actively canvas any talks, demos, or topics for the future. If you want to find out what it's like to speak at INOG, or you want to be <laughs> immortalized on the internet, um, go to inog.net slash talk, inog.net slash talk. There's an explanation of what's involved. You put in a very, very brief submission, goes to program committee, but you're pretty much a shoe in because we need speakers. Um, <laughs> There's a call for potential locations in 2018. Uh, the agenda is open. So if anyone feels like they can host uh, a meeting of approximately 80 to 100-ish kind of people, that would be great. We've kind of got past the exponential curve. We've kind of plateaued a little bit, which is great. Um, if you can help in any way, we really, really, really would love your help. Um, uh, that could be anything from you know, marketing, getting involved in Slack, it could be dealing with meeting content, PR, you know, building tools. I think Aiden's here as well, who hooked us up with Slack, uh, AutoReg and stuff like that. So whether it's technical or non-technical, we'd love you to get involved. Um, we're gonna send you out a very, very brief micro survey after this evening. And again, this is just the end of the first part. Second part, we're just gonna socialize um, and get to know each other a little bit. 
Um, the micro survey is our effort at continuous improvement. So we need to know what you think about the evening, what we did well, what we did not so well, um, and how we can do better. And if you have any ideas or any feedback, we'd love to hear about it. We don't want to become too much of a traditional meetup. We'd like to you know, try out new things as well. The next INOG is to be decided in 2018. So keep an eye on INOG.net, um, also on meetup.com. We're going to have four meetings. Again, thank you, Jose. It was his suggestion for four because we were getting a bit stressed out with like eight or something. Um, I want to really thank the presenters because without the content, we don't really have anything. So I'd really like to get a round of applause for Lorcan, Tim, Colin, Chilla, Daniel, and Jose again, if you don't mind. <laughs> two, two final bullet points. One, it's social time. Um, this is a community. So you actually, in building a community, you kind of have an obligation to make new friends. So that's how you can pay us back, is by going and talking to someone who you've never met before, say hello. Um, one of the things we introduced at the last INOG in Workday, which we just think is pretty cool, borrowed from the internet, is what's called the Pac-Man rule. So as you inevitably form into small clusters and tribes this evening, please, please, please leave a wedge or a gap open for someone to join your group. Okay, don't close out, don't, don't become too closed. So we can just keep kind of you know, populating the different groups. Um, the last thing is, courtesy of Facebook, there's gonna be some swag at the back, which you are free to go and grab down the back left. Um, a mixture of different things, so feel free to grab. And pretty much on that note, let's get into part two and a bit of socializing and then we're gonna give you a heads up around 9.45 or 10 o'clock. Thank you so much, Facebook.